we're bringing to you this um, this interaction, and we told you about the uh, sidelines of the Guta challenge that they're having, uh, resulting in some protests and the concerns they are raising about the inability of Ghana's authorities to implement a GIPC law, which says that it looks like the authorities are not enforcing that regulation. They're saying foreigners should not participate in retail trade. Because so far, it's indicated that they, they seem to be the unseeming and ending feud between the Ghana Union of Traders and also the Ghanaian authorities. And following the decision taken by the Nigerian authorities to close the Semi border, it's resulted in them enforcing or perhaps consolidated their position in this regard. But it's got some resultant effect. How would, would that uh, ultimately affect the relationships or relations between Nigeria and Ghana, as well as Nigeria and its neighbors? And we also do know that the African Union, uh, with the heads of states uh, in, in that General Assembly, had decided to promote the Africa Intercontinental Free Trade. What does it mean as well? And how would that affect the implementation of this policy in this regard. So we decided to have some great conversations. We already do have um, Dr. Lord Mensa. He is with um, the University of Ghana Business School, and he is going to help us contribute significantly to the subject. Um, in the course of the conversation, we'll have international relations expert Dr. Vladimir Nchidanso, and uh, with the Command and Staff College of the Ghana Armed Forces. And we will look at this uh, related issues in detail. But Dr. Lord Mensa is on the line. Good morning to you, Dr. Lord Mensa. Good morning, Roland, and uh, good morning to our viewers. Mm. And, and thank you for joining us. Um, let me ask you first you your general observations about this seeming feud uh, uh, b between uh, Nigeria and its neighboring countries. Roland, you know, um, if you look at uh, this and if you go by the numbers, you clearly see that in terms of trade export from Ghana to Nigeria, mm. and then in exchange, Nigeria to Ghana, you realize that Nigeria exports more into Ghana than, you know, um, Ghanaians export to Nigeria. So if Nigeria have closed their borders, uh, for me, I think the net effect will rather go against them. But then, uh, why are our, our, our Kenyan authorities and then the Kenyan traders making noise about this? You realize that, you know, even though our economy is small relative to Nigeria, Nigeria could have been a bigger market. Who could have? We could have exported more to Nigeria than they do into this country. So for me, uh, this thing shouldn't be a problem. We can do without export to Nigeria as a country. But if you look at the export composition, our export to Nigeria is not that much compared to what goes outside Nigeria, which is, uh, we know Nigeria is a big market. But we should also understand that, you know, over the years, we don't go to war with um, itineraries anymore. We do economic war. Mm. And every country that sees itself to be more powerful in terms of economics. When we're talking about economics, it's not about, you know, your... Uh, what you can do as a small country. These days, it's about the size of the country and the resources that it has. If you listen to Nigerians very well, they will indicate to you that they are the Chinese of Ghana, Africa. Sorry, They are the Chinese of Africa. And they have the numbers. So they believe that if they grow and wear Nigeria and eat Nigeria, I think they should be able to enhance their economy going forward. And I believe that this decision is not 2020 decision. I've heard some of the media stations talking about, you know, um, by January 2020, they should open up the border. I'm telling you, this goes beyond 2020 because whatever decision they are taking now, they know the possible economic repercussions. Like I told you earlier, they export more to Ghana than, you know, we do to them. So in the end, they know the possible economic repercussions. So therefore, whatever decisions they're taking now, they would like to um, see the impact. And economic decisions and impact, as a, a impact assessment is not one year, two years. So I believe this is going to extend for some time now. And this brings me back to, you know, those trade treaties that we've been signing across the continent. Mm -hmm. You know, Roland, Africa Union was formed before, you know, the, the, 
the, the, the okay. European Union. Okay. But at the end of the day, what has African Union done? We have not. We cannot even post up even a single railway line across uh, the west to the east of Africa, and really looking at the north to the south of Africa. So for me, most of those treaties have been a talk shop, where you know our leaders go and sit down. They don't really sometimes understand what they are, they are, they are tying themselves to. And I have come to believe that before you go and sign any international agreement, you should be able to ascertain your environment, grow your, your, your economy to a level where you think there could be spillovers to other economies. Then you go to the table for this agreement. But as it stands now, what has happened? You see an agreement being signed, but countries are closing their borders. Which is contradictory. So for me, I think I think we need to sit down as a country, get to know how powerful we be, our strength, going back to that Adam Smith economics, identify what we can offer. Because after all, Nigeria doesn't produce cocoa more than we do. So that's one of our strengths. So why don't we take advantage and ignore those their markets and then move ahead? So um, I believe that um, some of these things we don't need to make too much noise about it if we're going by the numbers. Now, uh, this is some form of protectionism, is, is that not it? Yeah, it is. I mean, we're growing and populations are growing. Human beings are realizing that they need to protect their own. If you look at um, how uh, Donald Trump came to power, it will give you a signal. Conservatives in the U.S., sorry, in the U.K., it will give you a signal that countries are growing to a level where their people want to have you know, what they have, and in the end, keep in what. And when they realize spillovers, I think they have come to realize that that's what helped the Chinese. The Chinese, for some time, were not part of any international trade treaty. treaty. They had to make sure that they grew the economy, their products as, you know, are accepted by their citizens before they think of, you know, moving beyond their borders. So um, uh, I think that is the position that uh, the global Things are going now. And I believe China is about time we sit down. Mm. And if you get to see the growth of fire right movement, especially in the West, which uh, seem to have um, a trickling effect um, down South, uh, down Africa, it also means that governments in the sub-region or in the region are becoming more aware about what the views of their citizens are to make sure they pursue their own. In particular for Nigeria, we're told that uh, commodities like rice, uh, related yeah. um, sugar and tomato, um, mainly produced also by big companies, if not uh, big industries in that country, uh, seem to be competing with others that uh, seem to be coming from uh, outside okay. their borders. And as a result yeah. of that, they would want to protect that. Uh, in what way should Nigeria be doing this beyond just border closures? Well, um, it's clear. But just that, I think uh, we were just, it, was, it just came as a shock, you know, because uh, there wasn't any early warning signal of that sort to indicate that Nigeria is about to close to their border. It wouldn't have got to a level where people would get stuck behind, you know, bringing to Nigeria borders, Ghanaian products that are going. If they were to give the signals, I, I, I think... Um, wouldn't have had those problems. But uh, um, they could have gone in, through it in a softer way. I mm. mean, given deadline, you know. Okay. From this day onwards, uh, we don't want uh, a product from those that are the end of the possibly categorize the product. Because I think as you understand that they cannot stop dependent completely when it comes to all products mm. uh, in terms mm. of the cons consumer, you know, space. So in the end... Uh, they should have categorized the project so the Ghanaians will know which products are likely to be accepted by the Nigerian market. But as it stands now, if our border has been closed, we don't even know which you know product can go into the country and which product can you know can, can come out of the country. And I believe that they've come to realize that there are some products like rice, not rice. Nigeria, if you take the Europeans who eat um, a mostly uh, staples from you know, they are part of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the continent. Um, they will tell you that the Igbos and all those, their staple is rice. And if you replace their local rice consumption with their foreign import, import rice, then more or less you are killing the market. And they've also studied that consistently, you know, 
after their structural adjustment reform, they've got to know that their, the dollar to the Naira consistently every week reduces. And if they don't do anything about it, um, it can affect their economy, you know, in the long run. So that is why you know, they're taking this position. And some of the information going around tells that we started feeling the impact to the extent that some of the stores are saying that their local rents are now being bought. So um, they know what they are doing. And uh, uh, the only thing is that it came as a shock. It should, it okay. should have come in a softer way. All right, P please be on the line because uh, we're also bringing in uh, more experts on, uh, into the conversation. Uh, we also have international relations expert also with uh, Gafsi. Ronald, right uh, um, I, need, I need to, I'm sorry, I need to leave for an assignment. Okay, I'm you want to, you want to, now, to so. that, but, but, but that'll be fine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lord Mensa with the University of Ghana Business School, uh, the economics department, and helping us with some uh, great insights there. And so we'll bring in uh, Dr. Vladimir Intridanso, international relations expert with Gafsi uh, uh, here in Accra, had been with Lesiad and also uh, knows the ins and out of some of uh, these impacts of these protectionist policies or decisions that have been taken. Uh, and thank you for joining us, Prof. But we also do know that mm. the general agreement on tariffs and trade uh, was in existence before the World Trade Organization came in. Uh, and, sure. and since then, we've had the impact of uh, the African Union now promoting NAFTA. Uh, before then, in the sub-region, we had uh, our own... Um, well, pact, making sure that uh, we wanted to have free movement of goods and services. But if you take that decision by Nigeria, how does it situate with all these pacts that have been signed by us as respective countries of these organizations? Well, thank you for having me. Um, the existence of the GATT and uh, of the WTO itself and of any other protocols relating to trade uh, do not uh, in themselves and by themselves uh, and join any country not to take protectionist measures. Protectionist measures are taken when the economy or the people who are manning the economy think that they need to protect the economy from either dumping or fake goods coming in or competition or whatever it is. But those things have been all proven to be false. That's uh, because free trade encourages competition rather and, and allows for good groups to be coming and going out. So notwithstanding the protocols that we have to say, ECOWAS or um, Africa, you know, boosting inter-African trade, which was the basis for the uh, African free trade area, et cetera, et cetera, incepted in 2012, or thereabout, it was signed by almost everybody. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't do that. So any country can do that. The repercussions are different and the shocks are uh, not symmetric. It's asymmetric in terms of the countries that uh, are joining. Mm, perhaps. Um, uh, we, we've come to learn through literature and also by other things that have been happening in relation to China that uh, populations become big markets and then the, the government of those big markets tend to dictate. Um, it, uh, uh, is, is that what Nigeria is trying to do? Well, somehow, but I think it has been proven to be false. Populations rather attract. What is happening in China, for example, is that almost all very big firms and that kind of thing are closing down wherever they are and trying to produce from China. So populations do attract. If Nigeria is, uh, if they are bringing in any new um, kind of theory, we don't understand. But such populations rather attract foreign direct investment. It attracts a lot of goods in and out. It attracts, they, it's at the production level, they have what we call the production gain. Mm -hmm. And if they gain, and China is gaining, and that's why China is able to export more. But if you close your doors completely, uh, it doesn't work. But what is happening between China and the U.S. is that the U.S. economy started hiccuping a little. And they believe that Chinese goods are coming in the more. Uh, but normally, under such circumstances, notwithstanding the rules and regulations, you see that there is always a retaliation. Even within the dispute settlement understanding of the WTO, uh, what Nigeria is doing, for example, you could retaliate. If you don't want to retaliate, you could just uh, report to the WTO. But what they will do is that when they find Nigeria guilty, uh, there's no punishment. What they want you to do is to retaliate to the tune of your loss. So these things are there. Uh, and personally, if you ask me, uh, once such things happen, you die alone. You, mm. you keep on let the opponent, opponent do that. He's losing if he continues to do that. And that's what China and the U.S. are doing right now. 
So mm. I have always advocated that we need to completely dialogue. There's no way we could use gendarmes to go and open the borders and that kind of thing. Nigerians are paying the price too, mind you. So we need to dialogue. Mm. But if, if in the midst of the dialogue, Nigeria still wants to hold sway, uh, by what means can it open its borders at the same time trying to uh, make gains and achieve its objectives? It cannot achieve its objectives if you know what the dialogue are talking about. Why is you dialoguing? You are using for opportunities to put your opponent that, hey, look, he's going to lose. For example, if all the adjoining countries uh, you know, begin to find new markets mm -hmm. uh, or begin to find new sources of uh, their raw materials, whatever, if they rely on Nigeria, Prove to Nigeria that they look, we dialogue. If you don't take it, this is what we're gonna do. Mm. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll bark in, you know, US, uh, China, you know what is happening now. So, uh, we can yes, threaten in, in, in dialogue or diplomacy. Uh, you use all kinds of tools in the tools box. So, you dialogue in, but you are threatening, you are using all kinds of the intrigue to achieve your aim. And I believe this is what ECOWAS countries must do now. Uh, those threats I've been hearing from other countries will not work. Uh, let's keep on dialoguing, let's keep on looking for avenues and looking for alternatives. In normally, when in your economy, uh, little um, international economies will show you that when in your economy you are having such a problem, you look for different sources and you look for different other uh, appetites. For example, if it's rice, uh, which is becoming a problem and that your country is being punished because of rice imports or rice exports, whatever it is, look for alternatives. Uh, that will make the other feel that, of course, the measure I've taken is of no use anymore. And that is what we should be doing. But if we sit down crying and thinking that we can punish Nigeria, I don't think that is the case. Okay. So uh, w w what should the other regional, or oh, the other countries in the regional grouping be doing, particularly in ECOWAS we're talking about? Because, uh, because it particularly in ECOWAS, we need to join forces together. All right? I understand Nigeria in some aspects. For example, rules of all region within the WTO system. We did all kinds of uh, trade systems. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't import canola, for example, or uh, Thai rice and bring it to Ghana and then re export it to Nigeria and things like that. Uh, but you can dialogue on those issues and put measures so that these things don't enter. What we have to be doing is to also check ourselves and see those things that we're doing against Nigeria, which are not correct. I don't think our governments are also doing what we did with African subregion. Mm. Two, what we need to do also is to come together as a front against Nigeria. In 2010, they did the same thing by uh, blocking 44 products coming to Nigeria, 33 of which affected Ghana. We went into dialogue. But at the same time, we also blocked some of the things coming together, especially the trip. And the trip is so bad. I, I remember very well, I was teaching my students about these things. And, and so we must find all those avenues, block where we can block, to get the energy a collective thing, and even though the pain is intimate. And then, how to go with feel it is different from how I propose to feel it because that person may not be relying on Nigeria too much. So in the asymmetric nature of the impact of the short, uh, we need to come together and make it symmetric or make it uh, uh, push it back onto us Nigeria. So we need to come together. Meanwhile, ECOWAS must be also talking and maybe threatening, maybe using other measures, using some punishment or whatever it is. Uh, there must be a collective act. There must be individual action. And I think they will both twice we use diplomacy. Now, in the geopolitics of, of the world, how does this country to country tend to mar relationships? Well, this is a mar relationships um, in two ways. In the first place, if, uh, the, uh, if the two sides become too belligerent, uh, it may end up a severing relationship, ambassadors are recalled, etc. One thing leading on to the other, and even on to war. You can have trade wars that lead on to actual wars. Uh, alternatively, the two sides may also find a way of uh, coming together after, after spoiling each, each other's economy while we were there. But yes, third also is when um, there is a long period that has um, the region and then the regional body may come in. And so, yes, these things have been happening internationally. That's a
Well, thank you very much. Dr. Vladimir yeah, Chidan. So, uh, an international welcome. relations expert uh, is now with GAFSI, and we're talking about the Command uh, and Staff College of the Ghana Armed Forces. Uh, had been with the Ligon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. So, has, has vast experiences in relation to this uh, subject that we're talking about. And, and subsequently, we also do know the position taken by Guta. Uh, we'd had some interactions with the Ghana Union of Traders Association representatives, and they are still holding on to their position that they want authorities in Ghana to implement the GIPC law, which dictates that for, uh, foreigners should not be players in the local retail sector. That should be a preserve of the local traders. What does it mean? Uh, what decision also will be taken by the Ghanaian authorities, we'll get to know. But please make sure that uh, if you have been a witness or have been affected by the border closure uh, of Nigeria, that is uh, the semi-border between Nigeria and Benin, please let us know. Either maybe you're a transporter, you're a commuter, you're just a normal citizen who tends to ply the route, or you're a trader who has been affected. Let us know through uh, WhatsApp platform 0540 10 909.